I've been thinking about marketplaces, so I got an expert to tell me more. Marcin Karik, who's the CEO of Noble9. He actually built companies focused on marketplaces and now thinks a lot about service level objectives. This is a bonus episode of The Business of Tech. So Marcin, you got my attention because of some of your work at your previous role. I'm going to talk a little bit about what you're doing at Noble9 uh, in a bit, but I actually want to dive in a little bit on your experience around marketplaces. And particularly for some of my listeners who may not even be familiar with the way online marketplaces bring together services and software and such, like, can you give me your definition of marketplaces? Uh, that's a very interesting question because probably there are, I don't know, as many people that many uh, definitions of marketplaces. Uh, when you take it from the bottom up, of course, you know, there, there's a marketplace that is um, focused on infrastructure. So anything you would see from cloud services to applications running on top of that cloud, uh, the cloud service, plus any type of managed service, for example, on top of that. Uh, so that's very popular when you're talking about AWS marketplace or Google Cloud marketplace. Um, or Cos Godwin as well. Um, so that's very, very specific. Then, you know, we have a lot of aggregators uh, that fit under the marketplace definition that, you know, focus mainly on, on SaaS and optimizing uh, contracting for SaaS. Uh, and then, you know, all kinds of different add-on marketplaces that many companies out there provide, like, you know, um, Google, Mar uh, Google Workspaces, for example, provide you a bunch of plugins for Gmail. Um, so to me, every single one of them fits in that category. We'll see a lot of that, uh, convergence, I would say right now, where, um, you know, infrastructure marketplaces also provide SaaS. Um, but it, it all stays in this category where it's simplifying the transaction with the end customer, basically. I like to start that, and you've ended actually with where I think the the lead into. Let's put ourselves in the mind of the customer, and you've you've been involved with doing marketplaces, and you've you've helped set them up. How does a customer approach this? Are they looking at it as just a software buying platform? Are they looking at like a complete solution? Like, are they viewing it as like walking into the mall and perusing? What's the mindset of a customer who's trying to leverage a marketplace? Uh, yeah, so I think over the years, and you know, I started marketplaces when uh, people were still thinking that Amazon is selling books. Um, so <laughs> it's been a while ago. You know, back in that day, I would say the customers were mainly looking for a POC, kicking tires, finding you know those few solutions that would make sense without really picking up the phone or or, or finding someone on the web. Um, with time, you know, over the past few years, I think the behavior has changed a lot. Um, and we see organizations, even, you know, large enterprises consuming from, from cloud marketplaces for a number of reasons, simplification of their billing, um, you know, uh, uh, make it easier for their internal teams, uh, to consume software. A lot of those organizations now allow separate teams pick the best tools for their job, for example. Right. So, uh, there are a lot of different reasons. I think there's a lot of room for for growth and improvement in those spaces, and you see a lot of that innovation happening, either AWS Marketplace, GCP Marketplace, figuring out how to really play with the channel, uh, bring the other entities on the platform, and, and really bring the full experience for the end customer. Okay. Now, I'm, I come from the services world, so I always like to think about it from, from that perspective. Um, you know, and I always quip the, the sort of Salesforce line of like there's 4 to $5 worth of services for every dollar of, say, Salesforce software that's sold. If I'm thinking about it that way, when I enter a marketplace as a customer or the marketplace is selling these solutions as a product, are they thinking about this as if I make it a combo meal? Is, it, is, the, is the Big Mac the software and then the, the plus fries is the services or is the is it really presented as the services are the lead where the product is dragged how is that presented uh it's going to differ across different types of those marketplaces that we started with but you know if you go with infrastructure right from the bottom um i would say that the focus is on consumption 
And you know, when you look at AWS or GCP, the goal for those uh, organizations is to really spin up the usage of their own services. So bring those customers on their platform, spin it up, and that's really where they make money, right? Um, when we go, uh, you know, higher, then I think we see more of a traditional, um, uh, classic approach where service companies are in, in, in quite similar situation, you know, help with implementation, uh, managed services solutions that are basically stitched together with, with the solutions offered by those marketplaces. So I think, like I said, you know, I think we're coming more to the traditional, uh, uh way of consuming, uh, software and enterprise. Why, while we remove the difficulty of configuration, you know, setup and operation on the cloud platform. Okay. Now I'm going to ask what might be a simplistic question, uh, but I think it's useful for definitions. Is, a, is the use of a marketplace e-commerce in your mind? Um, it would probably fit it under e-commerce definition. Yeah, I don't see why not. Okay, and and some of that is 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 when we're thinking about digital acquisition, uh, it's some of the strategies of e-commerce might actually work for many service providers. Um, now, I want to actually pivot a little bit because you know your your experience went from that, but now you've moved on to thinking more about service level objectives and stuff. Tell me a little bit about what you're doing now at, at Noble Nine. So Noble Nine is basically a, a dedicated platform for management of service level objectives. Uh, service level objectives come from Google, from SRE concepts um, that basically allow organizations to understand the behavior uh, of their applications and and uh, uh, see the proactive proactively see the impact on the customer satisfaction. Uh, so you know the reasons uh, why companies are adopting is this today is basically a uh, proliferation of, of microservices, APIs, and you know just the sprawl of, of different services that need to be incorporated into applications. Um, that makes it even more difficult to understand what other teams are doing. Even more so very basic things. <clears throat> you might have 20 different teams, 20 different applications, or different 20 different components of an application in your organization, and everybody's got a different reference point. So even finding this, what 99.9 what .9 means to one team might not mean the same thing to another team. So for us, it's all about standardizations, being able to truly understand the full impact of the application or, or any type of issue of the application on the end customer revenue. So it, it's it's more appealing to, uh, to execs. For any of us that have come from traditional infrastructure management, we're very familiar with the idea of a service level agreement or an SLA. What's the difference then between an SLA and an SLO? Well, SLA is basically a, a legal construct between the customer and the provider, right? And and again, those will differ not only across different organizations, different companies, but different teams technically, right? You can you have those examples where someone will exclude, for example, downtime that was planned or looks at a certain event in a different way. Um, so it, in many cases, what we find out, what we hear from our customers, a lot of those things are not necessarily very, I would say, accurate. Um, that, that might be. And it's really something to um, make it easier for the customer to understand what's being provided and, you know, provide those customers with, with credits or whatever it might be in, in an event of an issue, which happens, right? SLO is, is a little different. So also with SLAs, you really calculate SLAs after the fact. Something happens, you look at the downtime, you figure out according to your you know legal contract what it means and how you present it to the customer. SLOs are, are uh, very much proactive. They're designed for you to understand that something is degraded or something is going down, something is about to happen. And it lets you really figure out if you should be taking any actions, right? A good example is if you're running in a cloud in one region and you have a failover uh, um, opportunity for your application, right? If you see that it's degrading, you you might have time to make this decision if you want to fail over or not. And you know, failover is, is great on, on slides, but we all know it's a very costly operation. Um, so instead of doing this, you might understand SLOs might tell you that the issue that you're experiencing is not necessarily impacting all the customers, not necessarily impacting 
the revenue for those customers and you might not need to do those things, right? Okay. If I'm thinking then about an, the a relationship and the differences between an SLA and an SLO, is your vision of this then, what I'll use the Boolean references, is this an and or an or? <laughs> Do they Are they complementary or are they competitive? Like is it and or an or and why? I think it's a combination of both. So it would be, yes, it would be both are important. Um, the question is how much you will really want to expose to the customer. For now, the focus on SLO is very much internally. So it's 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 the relationship between two different teams. Let's say you, you build a service that's performing some function, fu function, I'm using that service in my application. If I take a dependency on your application, your application is only three, three nines and I'm exposing it to my customers as five nine availability, then I have an issue to start with, right? So understanding that relationship uh, is important for me internally. Now, for the for the external calculation from SLA perspective, that still might be five nines because you're excluding certain events, you're doing certain things, and that is fine. Um, we see more and more of our customers that are actually pushing that information very transparently and exposing SLOs, that SLOs basically become uh, um, their SLAs at the end of the day. It's, it's very similar to, you know, a few years ago, maybe more than a few years ago, uh, when we were buying something online, we just went there, there was some logo that it's super secure and don't worry about your credit card. We just put it in and everybody's happy. And, you know, with years, we start looking at um, security frameworks that you, you know, organizations start to implement and nobody would really use that uh, uh, solution if it wasn't uh, uh, built to certain uh, uh, specs, right? Um, we believe that we are heading in the same direction with availability. So right now, you know, we can tell the customers like, yeah, we're doing everything right and everything is good. Trust us, it's gonna be performing. We already see customers requesting that information. How are things implemented? Can you assure us that what we're seeing, what, what we're going to see is going to be truly coming from your systems? You know, so it's pushing beyond that SLA in a transparency that really helps us understand how your application is behaving, what are the controls that you put in place to really deliver that level of reliability? Now, the way you're talking about this, you're using all the cloud words, right? Which, which I would expect because it's very cloud forward and it's coming from a DevOps world. But I want to check, is, your, is the vision of the way you're thinking about this cloud only or simply everything and it's just because you're leading with cloud? Like what's the relationship then with SLOs and the cloud? Well, some people say that everything is going in the cloud. So if, if that happens, that's fine. Our solution is definitely not built just for cloud. Um, we work with uh, on-prem systems, um, hybrid solutions. So our focus from the beginning, from the architecture of the system has been the ability to run it in a hybrid environment and, and include on-prem systems. Because there still might be a few, there still might be you know applications where certain things are running, let's say, in a banking branch uh, just to process things. And we see a lot of those, right? So for us, it's, it's really the ability to service all of those use cases. Okay, now I'm gonna gonna then ask, which, which I would expect is probably an easy one for you on this, is how do I link SLOs to a customer's business outcome? Like how do I make that connection between the two from a business delivery perspective? Yep. So it, it definitely, you know, it's collaboration. There's there's no silver bullet at this point. Um, understanding your business and understanding of components of the application uh, that impact that revenue is still important to understand. There is there's no way around it. Uh, from that, you can really derive SLOs that are very, very specific uh, to your use case. Uh, think, for example, you know, you're selling tickets for events. Uh, everything is going fine because, you know, there are middle of the road artists or, or whatever it might be. You don't have this load yet. You might not notice any degradation. Uh, however, when you start, you know, one time you have this big, big artist, big name, and all of a sudden, you know, the system is not down, but it's also not processing a certain transaction. If it's, you know, checkout or maybe uh, picking a seat or whatever it might be. At that point, you might, from a business perspective, you, you have a full understanding that you get taking a hit on revenue um, and you can translate it to a very specific piece of that application or a very specific service that 
uh, 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 is part of that application. And then you, you can, you know, specify SLOs that, are, that define, let's say, the time from uh, picking a seat to um, selling the ticket or, or transacting that, that credit card transaction, right? Uh, that gives you a very good understanding of what's going on. So when you think about when you, when you have the spike, you start to see when things are, are degrading or going down and you might choose an action that that's going to uh, you know fix that problem or or you might figure out how to how to address it so all of all of those things are still very important to understand you can't just say slo solve my problem i don't have to understand my business to the contrary you really have to understand your business to derive slos that help you understand the impact on the customer and, and your revenue for that matter all right, so we both know that tools aren't necessarily the solution, they just enable it. If somebody's listening and saying, okay, this makes some sense to me, I wanna start applying this, how do they get started if they haven't been thinking this way or working with SLOs? Where's the beginning? Understanding your applications first, no question, uh, but we can help at every level. We provide services, anything from very simple boot camps that take a few hours uh, to help you understand potentially help you find the, the, the starting point, what makes sense, all the way to full implementations ourselves or with our service partners. Uh, so we can uh, we can take you all the way there uh, if you're starting. We can also, you know, just help with, with specific things. There are a lot of organizations that hired someone that understands SLOs, but they don't necessarily know how to convey that story to their team. We can help with that as well. We have a lot of tools and, and services that we can bring to the table there. Thanks for watching this bonus episode of the Business of Tech. If you like what you heard here, hit that like button and hit subscribe. It really helps and I appreciate the time that you do that. Additionally, if you wanna have a conversation, write something in the comments. I read them all and dialogue is the point. I don't necessarily claim to be right. I do want to make sure that we've engaged correctly. If you really like this content, you can find it daily on the Business of Tech podcast. Go to businessof.tech, click the big blue subscribe button, and find the podcast on whatever podcatcher you like to listen on. It's available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, or wherever fine podcasts are found. And if you want to help with the content delivery and you want to get access to things early, I've got a Patreon. You can support me directly. Go to patreon.com slash MSP radio and it's give what you want. You set the value of the content and help me make this kind of delivery on an ongoing basis. Thanks for listening and I will talk to you again soon.